Okay, uh, I think we are live. Welcome everybody to our show. Um, it is with great honor and a privilege to be hosting Mr. Joseph Wong today. Uh, he served as a senior open market operations trader uh, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. And today I'm going to be asking him questions. We're going to be discussing topics concerning financial plumbing. So, uh, and I know that Mr. Wong was right in the middle of the 2019 repo market crisis. As you may remember, during September 2019, the repo rates spiked dramatically as the financing needs of the primary dealers increased substantially. So uh, what I want to ask initially is, what really happened in September 2019? What was behind the spiking repo rates? Sure. Well, first of all, okay, I'd like to thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's a great pleasure. <laughs> and of course, um, I've read your work and I think it's great. And I'm very impressed by, by how good it is, especially at such a young age. So, okay, uh, so it, it's great to be here speaking with you. And thank you so much. You're right. <laughs> you're right that the September, it's in, uh, in September 2019, there was a huge spike in repo rates. And it was, it was probably the uh, craziest thing I saw when I was on the open market. Okay, other than COVID on the open markets desk. <laughs> so for, for people who don't know, uh, the repo market, it's uh, usually a very quiet market. So people borrow overnight loans secured by treasury collateral in the repo market. And it's a very big market. So there's about a trillion dollars done every day, um, you know, sometimes more, sometimes less. And usually you expect the, the volatility of the rate to be pretty low. But in September, something strange happened. So, you know, earlier in September, it was about, you know, about two, a bit above 2%. But, you know, in a, sometime in the middle of September, it's spiking. And I remember that day very, very closely because I was actually uh, very early on the desk that day. And I got in and repo market opens at 7 a.m., right? So I got in right before I sat down, I immediately got a phone call. It was a, it was a dealer. Um, so just more background, the people who borrow in the repo markets, they're the dealers, securities dealers. And the people who lend, they tend to be um, money market funds or commercial banks. So the reason that dealers borrow in, in the repo market is one, either to fund their inventory of securities. So the business model of a dealer they warehouse securities, right? They buy treasuries or something like that yeah. and then sell them to clients. But in order to do that, they have to have money to buy the securities. So the repo market provides short-term funding for that. They also borrow on the repo market so they can lend to, let's say, other dealers or hedge funds. So they could borrow overnight and then lend, to, let's say, two weeks or a month, a slight amount of maturity transformation. So the primary borrowers in that repo market are the dealers. And you know, so back, back, you know, 7 a.m., I get to my desk, somebody starts calling and it's like, hey, hey, have you looked at the, what's happening in the roof market before, right? And I'm like, no, I just I sat down. I haven't even opened up my Bloomberg terminal. So, oh, but I'll sit down. He's, and the dealer sounded kind of panicked, you know, you know, the repo is not behaving right. You got to, you got to look into this. And so I logged into Bloomberg and right before I could go to the repo page, someone else called. They're like, hey look at the repo market. I've never seen this in my life before. It's, it's, it's not supposed to be like this. And so I, I, I looked and, you know, it was supposed to be like maybe two, two, two point one five percent It was like five, 6%. So that's not supposed to happen. Um, and just a few minutes later, even more where people were calling, then, then I kind of knew that something was really, really wrong. Uh, the repo market was basically spiking in an uncontrollable way that it was not supposed to happen. And what ended up happening that day is that the Fed had to intervene. And so for the first time since um, the, the financial crisis, the Fed had to start lending in the repo market to try to, to try to put down the repo rates. And that was very effective. So and repo rates spiked as high as 9% that day. But after the Fed started intervening, everything went back to normal. So that was very effective. And if you to think to understand why that happened, um, I think you have to understand a couple of dynamics about the repo market. Uh, first, it's that it's very, very inelastic. So back to the people who borrow in the repo market, the primary dealers, well, not just the primary dealers, the dealers in general, um, they have, they, 
borrow every day overnight to fund securities and to lend to let's say terminal loans so they have to get funded no matter what the price it's it's very inelastic the demand for repo funding is very inelastic so no matter the price they have to pay because if they don't get funding then well you know then maybe they'll have to sell some securities and well, that can be disorderly um, it's kind of like you know if you think about a bank you have deposits at a bank and then you have longer term assets like loans right mm -hmm. um a dealer kind of has to roll their repo funding every day just like a bank has to roll deposits every day right you can withdraw your deposit from a bank anytime so you can kind of think of it as you lending to the bank every day so in a sense a dealer is kind of like that uh, so it needs to make sure it has funding so another aspect of the repo market is that it's a it's a cash market and in, there's not a lot of visibility into how much cash is available for lending into it every day. So um, let's say you are like a money market fund. Um, every day you have people deposit money into you and investors take out money. You don't actually know how much cash you'll be left with at the end of the day. You have an estimate that you don't, but you don't really know for sure. And that lack of visibility, I think sometimes uh, it, it, so if you're if you if you're borrowing in the repo market and you have to let's say borrow a billion dollars no matter what, um, you just assume that that one billion dollars is going to be there, but sometimes it's not going to be there, and on on those days in September it wasn't there, and the reason that it wasn't there, it, well, you have to so just just going back a little bit. So if you look at SOFR volumes, which is like a public index for repo roof borrowing then at that time, um, over the preceding months in 2019, the amount of borrowing in repo just kept going higher and higher. So there's increasing demand for repo funding. Um, at the same time, there was a decreasing amount of money available to be lent in repo. Usually, historically, the money market funds were the primary lenders in repo. And but the repo demand kind of surpassed what the money market funds had and so the marginal lender of the re in the repo market ended up being the commercial banks uh, the commercial banks had enormous amounts of liquidity as a consequence of qe and so they were basically lending that liquidity into the repo market um, for them it was a kind of a, a small yield enhancement strategy repo rates were above ior so they can earn a few extra basis points if they actually lend into the repo market as far as I know, part of the reason, uh, sorry to interrupt you, by the way. Um, oh, please ask questions reason, anytime you want. Part of the reason why the repo rate spiked, from what I remember, was that there weren't a lot of reserve balances in the banking system in the first place. Um, the Federal Reserve had been conducting a quantitative tightening operation where it allowed uh, bonds to mature, treasury bonds to mature on this balance sheet, and it didn't roll over maturing debt. So what ended up happening was that the Treasury had to issue more bonds to the banking system, effectively lowering the amount of reserve balances, which could have been lent into the repo market and ease the Treasury. Um, and Mr. Z the Credit Suisse analyst Zoltan Posar has a good illustration of this example uh, regarding what you said about the supply and demand in the repo market. When there is excess supply, more supply than demand, the Federal Reserve absorbs that supply uh, via its uh, reverse repo program. If there is an excess demand, on the other hand, the Federal Reserve will supply its, um, its the amount of funding needed via its uh, lending facility or right now the standing repo facility. So, yeah. So going back to, so you're right in, uh, in that sense. So. Like I was mentioning at the time, the marginal lenders in the repo market were the commercial banks. And just as you mentioned, the Fed was doing quantitative tightening at that time. So it was basically withdrawing reserves from the system. So just as demand for repo financing was increasing, the amount of money available to lend in the repo market was decreasing uh, due to quantitative tightening, as you mentioned. And so eventually, um, a shrinking supply of money meant an inelastic demand curve and boom, rates spiked. But I would push back a bit about this idea of reserve scarcity, though. Uh, the reason being that the people who borrow in the repo market, um, you know, most of them don't even have reserve accounts. A, ha a lot of dealers do not. Well, actually, most of dealers don't. And most of the end borrowers in the repo market 
the hedge fund community don't have reserve accounts either. So it literally can't be and I, a, about reserve scarcity because they can't hold reserves anyway. Uh, I think of it more as simply not enough money or not enough liquidity to lend. Um, for example, you could easily have a circumstance where the money market fund universe had more uh, assets to lend, more deposits, so to speak, whereas that would have worked as well, even if, uh, let's say, reserve levels were much lower. So um, I think of it as simply not enough um, liquid assets in the short-term markets to meet the demand for repo financing. And uh, having um, discussed, having mentioned the standing repo facility, I would like to ask a question about it. Um, as you know, the SRF has a maximum limit of $500 billion. So yeah. my question is, if there is an excess pressure, an unforeseen excess pressure in the repo market, will this SRF facility will be a very decent backstop? Will it alleviate the pressure in the repo market in this case? So I happen to think the, um, the SRF will never, ever be used. Um, the reason being is that we, so going back to the point that the commercial banks are the basically the marginal lender in the repo market once rates go above interest on excess reserves. So the level of liquidity held in the commercial banking system is enormous. You know, it's like, you know, a few trillion dollars. And so um, it's really, really, really hard for repo rates. Ah, yes, exactly right. Ah, perfect. So you see that spike there. So all that money. So the moment that repo rates rise above interest on reserves, then the commercial banks start thinking, hey, you know what? Instead of earning interest on reserves, I can lend in the repo market and get some extra return. And so you have literally trillions of dollars in the banking system that's ready to lend in repo. Um, so that it's very, very difficult to spike for repo rates to go up in a, in a, in a world where there's super abundance of reserves. Um, that being said, back then, um, if there was a standard repo facility, I, I, I think you're absolutely right that repo rates would not, would not have spiked. Um, because at that point, then if repo rates got too high, then the dealers could have just borrowed from the Fed. Um, I, I will caveat that with just one minor detail though. So the SRF is only available to the primary dealers in some banks. So there will be some bank smaller dealers who will not have access to it. And so um, it's possible that they could still face very high borrowing costs simply because they don't have access to the SRF. Right, yet yeah, it, it may be possible that in the future, uh, the Fed widens the eligibility so that even smaller dealers have access to it as well. All right, well, just like in the, um RP facility where only a certain set of money market funds are eligible to participate in the uh, RRP facility. Some money market funds aren't eligible to participate in that. So uh, speaking of RRP, I know that you were tasked with RRP operations back in, uh, in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So I would like to ask you a question about the RRP facility. So what is the main driver of the RRP facility right now? Is it the scarcity of the uh, treasury bills in the market or is it due to debt ceiling or is it due to the increasing asset under management levels of the money market funds? Yeah, that's a, that's a, I think I, that's a great question. And I think of the RRP, so RRP facility, if you guys remember just a few months ago, the participation is maybe around zero. Now it's like almost 1.5 trillion. So there's a huge, huge increase in the RV participation. I think if there's there's one major driver that's overarching and there's a more of a localized driver. The major driver of the RP has to do with just quantitative easing. So when the Fed goes and buys assets through quantitative easing, it's creating uh, reserves and reserves can only be held by the banking system, right? So when the Fed, let's say, expands its balance sheet by you know, $4 trillion, then the banking system also expands by $4 trillion because it has to hold those extra reserves. So that's fine, except that under Basel III, banks have a, something called a leverage ratio, which constrains how large it is. It may sound silly that a bank can ha not have enough space to hold all the money, but it's actually true. So under the leverage ratio, uh, banks kind of, don't want to hold a lot of um, uh, 
low, they don't want to hold lots of low return reserves. They want to optimize your balance sheet for higher return assets. So what happens if someone comes to, if you're a big bank and someone comes to you with a whole bunch of deposits that you don't want, uh, then what you do is you say, hey, you know, I don't really want all your deposits, but can you put these deposits in a money market fund, right? And so the depositor takes that money, puts it into a money market fund, and the money market fund then basically invests it into the RRP. So you can think of the RRP in this instance as a way for uh, as a way for the Fed to control the side effects of QE. The side effects of QE being uh, just bloating bank balance sheets. The RRP offers an escape where excess reserves can leave the banking sector and go to the RRP, um, so that the banks will not push up against their leverage ratios. So that's that's I think I think of that as the bigger macro picture. Um, simply because no matter how much collateral there is in the short short rate in the front end, that's what will happen. And the more near term issue, as you mentioned, has to do with the treasury bills. So in the U.S., there's a debt ceiling where um, where where the government cannot issue debt in excess of uh, this debt ceiling. So. When we approach the debt ceiling, what happens is that the treasury tries to find space under the debt ceiling by reducing the amount of short-term debt it's issuing. So it starts paying down the treasury bills. And that's great uh, for the debt ceiling, but it's not that great if you are an investor in treasury bills, because then you don't have anything to invest in. And the biggest investors in the treasury bills space are the money market funds. So they have about $4.5 trillion in assets. So the money market funds are getting a whole bunch of cash that the banks don't want. And usually they would just invest that into treasury bills and everything will be fine. Uh, but if they're not enough treasury bills, then then you know, they go to their alternative, which is the reverse repo facility. And so in the immediate time right now, there's been a tremendous reduction in bills outstanding and that's contributing significantly to the RRP participation, as you mentioned. Now, eventually the RRP, the debt ceiling is going to be resolved. And when that happens, the treasury can start issuing more bills again. And money funds will take money out of the reverse repo facility and invest that into the um, into treasury bills. So um, eventually this will pass, but um, only, only after the debt ceiling is resolved. Uh, as you might also say, treasury bills serve a very important role in the US funding markets because they are the collateral. So in some sense, one could say, that treasury bills play a very crucial role in, uh, in the US financial stability. Um, so speaking of financial stability, I would like to move on to my next question. As you know, the Federal Reserve has recently introduced a FEMA repo facility. For those who do not know FEMA, it's Foreign and International Monetary Authority repo facility. Am I correct, Mr. Wang? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, so, according to this new, uh, with this new facility, central banks, I mean, in the beginning of the pandemic, there was a heavy selling in the U.S. Treasury bond market, especially from the side of um, foreign central banks. And this put a tremendous downward pressure on, uh, on the prices of the U.S. Treasury securities and yields went up. And yields going up doesn't mean uh, yields going up means that the cost of borrowing for individuals and businesses also going up as well. And that should the increasing yields should also put a downward pressure on equity prices. So it's not a good occurrence for the U.S. financial system. So with the advent of this new FEMA repeal facility, central banks will be able to pledge their treasury securities as collateral to the Federal Reserve and borrow. Uh, U.S. dollars. They will be credited U.S. dollars in their uh, accounts at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. So my question to you is, can the Federal Reserve's roles as a market maker and lender of last resort prevent any future imbalances in the euro dollar market? So the euro dollar market, so for, for those of you who don't know, there's something special about the U.S. dollar in that it's uh, used globally, uh, it's based. Um, if you think about foreign trade, about half of foreign trade, even trade without the U.S., is invoiced in U.S. dollars. And banks across the world, outside of the U.S., uh, take U.S. dollar deposits and make U.S. dollar loans. And there's you know, 
over 10 trillion of this stuff of offshore dollars. Um, so this is an interesting problem because if you are a bank outside of the US and you have a dollar deposits and dollar assets, you don't necessarily have access to the Fed as lender of last resort. And so things can get disorderly if uh, you have a liquidity squeeze. And Kayla, as, as you mentioned earlier, so during last March, there was just that exact type of dollar liquidity squeeze. And so you had a lot of foreign central banks who held their dollar reserves in, for, in the form of treasuries, selling those treasuries for cash to help support their domestic banking system and their domestic businesses who needed dollars. So in a sense, the offshore banking system, dollar banking system is not so much, uh, not always directly supported by the Fed, but supported by foreign central banks who hold dollar reserves, right, in the form of treasuries. Um, what usually happens when there's a panic in the offshore dollar banking system is that the Fed goes out and the Fed starts lending to foreign central banks in the form of foreign uh, US dollar swap lines. And you saw that happen last March. So the Fed started lending to the ECB and uh, you know BOJ and many other central banks. And I think overall, we got up to almost half a trillion dollars outstanding to the foreign, these foreign central bank swap lines. And what the foreign central banks do is they take these dollars and they lend them to their domestic banks who need dollars. And so in a sense, the Fed kind of has direct support or indirect support for the offshore dollar banking system. So this has been successful the past last March and during the financial crisis of 2008. So it seems like this is, so the way that you could see that this is successful is that you would look at the um, FX swap basis, which is the rates that let's say offshore banks would pay to borrow US dollars. And once the Fed rolls out the swap lines, the basis shrinks. And so I think based on that, you can see that just these swap lines have been very successful. Now, the thing about the swap lines though, they are not um, with everybody. Some, there are some, some of them, uh, some of, it's a political decision and you know, the US is not on super friendly terms with everyone. And that's why there's this FEMA repo facility that you mentioned, Kale. And you can kind of think of it as a facility, probably largely with China in mind. Uh, China is a very large country with an enormous amount of dollars in their in their in their banking system. Uh, I think recent regulatory filings show that they have their their banking system has over a trillion dollars, and of course, on the sovereign level, their government so over three trillion dollars in FX reserves. Now, not all of it in U.S. dollars. Um, so they don't have swap lines, but they have large dollar needs, and so the FEMA repeal facility would be. Uh, basically help plug a hole in the in the Fed's global dollar safety net by offering these sovereigns a way to get dollars even if they don't have FX swap lines. So I think of this as kind of covering the global banking system in terms of the offshore dollar world. However, the offshore dollar world is more than just banks. There's also offshore dollar capital markets. Um, as you know, um, what happened what's happening in the world is that we kind of are moving away from a bank intermediate system to a capital markets intermediate system where people borrow in the capital markets rather than from banks and the offshore dollar capital markets is also very large you know it's like foreign companies borrowing dollar loan dollar issuing dollar debt to foreign based investors right so it's foreign to foreign it's large it's dollar denominated and it's outside of the banking system. And these people don't really have access to swap lines. We saw something similar happen. Um, so last March, I saw something similar happen to the onshore capital markets. There was just complete illiquidity in the corporate debt market. And so the Fed launched the, uh, let's say, uh, secondary market corporate credit facility and the primary market corporate credit facility, basically bar buying up, let's say, uh, corporate debt, just to provide liquidity to kind of unfreeze the market. One thing to note, though, is that to be eligible to for those Fed facilities, you had to be a U.S. company. So if you are a euro dollar offshore company issuing um, offshore bonds in dollars, you will not you kind of be out of luck. So I think in the offshore dollar world, in the euro dollar world, that is probably just the one spot that the Fed doesn't cover right now. But, um, you know, it, uh, 
maybe the, maybe things will change. Maybe the these the, the, the the onshore facilities are strong enough to reverberate to the offshore. I, I don't know, but if I if I if I looking across just the offshore markets, I think that's just probably the part I, I see that's not covered. I read an the article discovered, yeah. recently about how an increase in the use of capital markets can actually enhance the transmission mechanism of the monetary policy, um, because as you also said. Uh, the pricing of loans in the banking system differs from the pricing of, say, corporate debt. You, as you might also say, corporate debt has have a certain spread above U.S. Treasury securities of similar maturities. So it kind of enhances the transmission mechanism because when the Federal Reserve sets short-term target interest rates or when any other central bank sets a short-term level of interest rates, uh, other money market rates that are shorter term uh, also follow, tend to follow these short term rates. So they do enhance uh, monetary policy transmission mechanism. So speaking of the pricing of loans, I would like to move on to my next question, which is why have the U.S. domicile banks been using LIBOR when pricing their uh, dollar loans and what will the introduction of sulfur, uh, how will sulfur affect the financial system? So, yeah, I, I don't actually know why LIBOR became super popular. I mean, it's, uh, so, you know, there, of course, there are different reference rates and some take off and some don't. Right now, there's their reference rates called Ameribor, there's Bloomberg Short-Term Bank Funding Index, BSBY, and there are others, and some take off and some don't. Um, I, I, I guess LIBOR probably was popular because it was used by all the major banks. And also, there's also a very deep derivatives market around it so that you can hedge your borrowing from it. And that's very important if you're a bank. You can hedge your funding, you can swap your loans from fixed to floating and vice versa. So uh, I think that might be it. So LIBOR was um, basically very widely used up until the financial crisis and even is widely used today. But the official sector in the US has been trying to phase out LIBOR because they perceived LIBOR to be, I think, not credible. So there were some scandals during the financial crisis where it, it seemed like there might be some people trying to manipulate LIBOR. And so uh, using that as a, as a pretext, the official sector wanted to move off of LIBOR. And what they proposed to be a was a rate called SOFR, which is a repo rate. It's basically overnight, uh, the rate that uh, you would borrow over, overnight in a repo market using treasury collateral. The thing about SOFR is that it's, it's, an, it's very different from LIBOR. It is a risk-free rate. So you're borrowing against treasury securities. There's no credit risk component. So they're not directly comparable in that sense. Um, you know, one way to think about this is, let's say that you are a lender, right? And you're lending some lending someone to uh, with a with a loan that's indexed to LIBOR. Then last March, when everything was kind of crashing, when there's stress in the financial system, LIBOR would have shut up, right? And then you would have received more compensation for the greater risk that you're taking. But if your same loan was indexed to SOFR, well, SOFR did the opposite thing, right? SOFR during times of stress, risk-free rate, everyone goes to uh, repos as uh, safety. So, you know, it, it kind of has behaves the opposite way that you want. When you're when there's more risk in the system, you actually earn less. So it's not a direct replacement for, for LIBOR. And I think that that's why you see there's a lot of efforts right now um, in the private sector to come up with alternatives to, to LIBOR, such as Bloomberg, uh, BSPY, Bloomberg Short Term, Bank index, which is which is which is also a, a credit risk rate. Uh, the official sector says that you can't use LIBOR anymore, but you don't have to use SOFR. So, uh, so there might be a world where you have SOFR, but you also have alternatives. And of course, something else that uh, to keep in mind is SOFR is an overnight rate, whereas LIBOR is a f is a three month rate. So, you still have to be able to create. Um, so, of course, that's not the same thing. But there's an effort to create a forward-looking SOFR using SOFR derivatives in the future. So maybe that, that part would be fixed. What, From what, what I mm -hmm. the police so, continues. 
So SOFR, however, is being widely adopted in the official sector. So if you are, um, let's say, GSC, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, Federal Home Loan Bank, uh, they are using, they are moving from LIBOR to SOFR. And for them, it makes sense because lending to a government agency is basically risk-free, right? So it makes sense for them to use SOFR as a risk-free rate, as a, as a reference rate. Yeah. And from what I remember, the SOFR rate also spiked back in the repo market crisis of September 2019 because uh, SOFR represents the risk-free repo rate. So when repo rates, repo market rates spiked dramatically in 2019, so did SOFR rates in, a, in each percentile. So one might also say that the reason why the Federal Reserve has introduced the SRF facility may also have something to do with the, uh, the transition process to SOFR. Um, so that's an interesting Absolutely. Point. Absolutely. It's if you have a reference rate that you can't control, it's not good, right? So let's say you have Fed funds. I, you, if the, the federal funds is your policy rate, you want to be able to control it. If one day SOFR were to transition to a policy rate, you'd have to be able to control it too, right? right. It would be very awkward if you said that I want to raise rates to 1% and not have the tools to do that. But the federal funds market has become obsolete due to quantitative easing. There is only arbitrageurs. I don't know if I pronounced it correctly, but uh, there are federal home loan banks on the supply side and um, foreign branches, uh, US, U.S. banks of foreign branches on the uh, demand side. And there is the FDIC cost associated with expanding the balance sheet. So let's say if the, uh, if the IOER rate is at 0.10%, under no excess supply or excess demand, one would expect the federal funds rate to be at 0.06% due to, due to the arbitrage and the regulatory costs. So um, pre-2008, as you might also say, federal funds rate was really important in the conduct of monetary policy. It still is. It's still the target rate. But the Federal Reserve uh, had to drain some excess supply of reserve balances in order to form uh, in order to set the federal funds rate, in order to control it, because be the Federal Reserve did not pay any interest on excess reserves before, two th before 2008, and, and tr an ample supply of reserve balances would have put pressure on the Fed funds market and driven the rates down to zero, but that's not the case. So, yeah, we'll see what happens with SOFR. Just, I think there was only 50 days left. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Uh, what do you think about the 2016 money market fund reform? How has it changed the financial system? Yeah, so for background, um, in, in the U.S., money markets are kind of, people almost think of them as, a, as an alternative uh, so to, to a checking deposit where you put money into a money market fund and you get, earn some interest that's higher than zero. The mark fund takes that money and invests it in very a very safe short-term assets. Um, money market funds were considered to be just very safe. If I put $100 in, I expect to always get $100 out. But during the financial crises of 2008, uh, one money market fund, well, actually, uh, maybe more than one, basically what they call broke the buck. So what happened was that um, the, that one money market fund, the reserve primary, put money to Lehman Brothers, and Lehman Brothers went bankrupt. So they lost a lot of money. So the people who put money into that money market fund could no longer take, let's say they put $100 in, they could now, now no longer take $100 out. And so that caused massive panic in the money market fund space because people began to realize that, well, first of all, money market funds, maybe they're not safe, right? So there was a massive run on the money market fund complex back then. And money market funds usually lend short term to banks. And so when people were th withdrawing money out of the money market funds, the money market funds then had to stop lending to the banks. And so then the banks were losing money too. So basically a run on the money market funds led to a run on the banking system. So that was, that was not good. And after the financial crisis, the regulators 
wanted to fix that to make sure that, you know what, I want to make money market funds safer so that we don't have these run dynamics anymore. And that's what the 2016 money market fund refund reform was about. So they tried to make money market funds safer uh, through a number of ways. Uh, they introduced, for example, uh, liquidity metrics where money market funds had to hold so much of their assets in uh, daily liquidity or one week liquidity and so forth. And most importantly, they instituted something called uh, gates and fees. So if a money market fund was, let's say, becoming having some trouble meeting their withdrawals, they could kind of shut everything down and just stop redemptions. So kind of like a, uh, a bank holiday, so to speak. So these, re these reforms um, largely apply to the prime money market funds. So in the money market fund space, there's two types of funds. There are government funds and there are prime funds. Government funds can only uh, lend to government uh, to the government, so they can only buy treasuries or lend in treasury-backed repo. The prime funds can lend to banks. And it was the prime fund that were obviously subject to the most of the money market fund reform. Um, 2016 basically fundamentally changed the money market fund industry. Many investors saw that, you know, if I put money into my, in a prime money market fund, then, then I might not be able to get my money back when I need it the most, right? That's, that's kind of a huge problem. So I can get my money back whenever I want, except when I really, really need it because the money market might gate redemptions. So that's a tremendous problem. That was basically a, a no-go for a vast majority of investors. And so you had uh, a huge shift within the money market space where you had $1 trillion of prime fund assets move to the uh, government money market fund assets. Massive. 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 In a sense, you can. I kind of think of it as killing the prime funds. The prime funds became so small. So <laughs> they used to be huge lenders to banks now they're just i think today there's like 600 billion left and uh they had there was a bit more in, in 2016 i think so that basically killed the prime funds they 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 shrink they shrink significantly but the funny thing is that the 2016 money market fund reform actually did not fix the money market funds because when you fast forward to last march uh you had the COVID situation there was another run on the prime funds so it didn't help. And to be honest, the reforms made it worse because all the investors saw that, you know, uh, what if I'm invested in a prime fund and suddenly they have to start gate, they, they, they gate redemption so that I can't get my money out. Well, if that's the case, I better get my money out right now, right? So everyone is thinking this. And so the, everyone was trying to get the money out of the prime funds ASAP. So the reforms actually caused or precipitated uh, an additional run on the prime funds last March. Um, uh, but the, the Federal Reserve's corporate credit facility, I think, alleviated some of that pressure. Yeah, it did help. <laughs> and if they, so it wasn't the corporate credit facility. They had actually a money market liquidity fund. Uh, they had two facilities, actually. It's a commercial paper or something facility and a money market fund liquidity facility. It was basically uh, a way to, to help money funds prime funds liquidate their assets to meet redemptions. Um, when the market has stress, there's no liquidity. So if you have, let's say you're a prime fund and you're holding a three month CD to a large bank, um, usually you can sell that CD, get the cash to meet your withdrawals. But when there's no liquidity, you can't do that. So the Fed stepped in with some facilities to help restore some liquidity so that the prime funds can meet their withdrawals. And that did help. So. The Fed stepping in, acting as you know, lender of last resort, uh, uh, did save the prime funds at that time. We're living and in such. They actually did, they did the same thing in 20, 2018, uh, 2008. Yeah. And uh, I'd like to move on to a, a question about the, uh, uh, the monetary policy aspect of financial plumbing. What do you think is the biggest driver? of the 10-year treasury notes right now? Yeah, it's, you know, the 10-year treasury. So I think as, as a background, you see that it, the yields are very low, let's say 1.5%. You know, inflation's 5 6%. You're in a backdrop where you think that maybe inflation could be higher. 
um, because uh, the government has, you know, continues to spend a lot of money. So I think most people would look at this and think it's kind of strange, but I would say that the treasury yield is, is, is not really determined by like say views on fundamentals, but because that's because of the special role that treasuries play in, in the financial system. Uh, they're a form of basically, a, you know, it's a risk-free asset that under regulations, many people have to hold or at least are encouraged to hold. So if you're a big bank and let's say you have to hold a certain amount of high quality liquid assets, you could think of holding a treasury, not because you think it's a good investment relative to where inflation is, but because it's yields higher than interest on reserves and uh, you can hedge out some interest rate risk. If let's say you're a giant pension fund, maybe you have longer term liabilities, right? So you need to match that with longer term assets preferably assets that have no credit risk. So you could think of buying treasuries as well. Um, or if, let's say if you are a foreign central bank and you want to, you're getting a lot of inflows and in, dollar inflows into your country, you have to take those dollars and recycle them into safe assets. So you buy treasuries. So the thing about that. US treasuries is that there are many people who buy them who don't care at all about, let's say, uh, what you would commonly think of as fundamentals, let's say inflation, growth, path of policy, things like that. Uh, it's They just need them because of the special attributes that treasuries are. And so to, to, to think about what drives yields, it's, it's a hard story because you don't really know uh, which of these uh, buyers is, is, is the marginal buyer. Of course, the Fed is of course buying 80 billion a month, a few are next month, regardless of what, what the fundamentals are. So you can have very smart macro funds and fundamental investors, um, basically, you know, making some kind of calculation and buying or shorting tre treasuries. But there's just so many other people in that market who, who basically approach these treasuries in a different framework that um, it's, it's hard, I think, to, to take a fundamental signal from where yields are trading. It's not really, uh, I, I, I think it's determined by many things other than what people commonly think of as, let's say, fundamentals. I know that some banks are purchasing long-term treasury bonds and hedging them with interest rate swaps. And uh, yeah. given the swap spread, negative swap spread, uh, treasury yields are greater than uh, the fixed leg of the OIS swaps. Yes. So this also presents an arbitrage opportunity for financial institutions. Um, and from what I know, the reason why OIS rates diverge from treasury yields uh, is mostly due to uh, balance sheet constraints because um, engaging in swap transactions requires balance sheet capacity, um, whereas purchasing treasury securities is merely an asset swap. You swap reserves or cash or deposits uh, in exchange for treasury securities. So uh, we still have some time and I'd like to pick a few questions from the comments section. Sure, happy to help. Uh, might be uh, something I don't know though. So if so, I will tell you I don't know. <laughs> uh, so the first question is, when do you presume the QE will come to a total end in 2022? And, uh, and to follow up on that, there are talks that the Federal Reserve will increase the size of tapering to $20 billion from $15 billion if inflation prints substantially higher in the following periods. So what are your thoughts on that? So, I, well, the Powell has kind of come, already come up with a timeline, right? They're going to taper and until the middle of next year. That's what they said. So I assume that that's what they're going to do. Um, the way that the Fed usually works is that it's very slow and also it doesn't like to change its mind because from a, from a central bank's perspective, managing expectations and credibility are extremely important. So if he said that he's going to end purchases in, you know, next, uh, next middle of next year, I would assume that's the case. Um, that being said, as you, as you know, right now, there's a lot of things are up in the air. It's not clear who will be the next federal reserve, um, uh, you know, govern. Uh, so who will be the next person in charge? So it could be Powell, it could be Brainerd. And I think, I think what, one way you can look at this is that ultimately the Fed is a political institution, right? And so when you have 
the Fed has a mandate, so you can have, let's say, uh, it wants to have full employment and you know stable inflation. And sometimes these two are in conflict with each other because, you know, say for example, there might be a trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Not so strong in the past 10 years, maybe it doesn't exist like we are right now, right? Inflation is high, but supposedly unemployment is also high. So if you valued unemployment more, then you would keep rates low and you would, let's say, be slow to unwind your balance sheet because you think it's more important to have lower unemployment and you can, it's okay to have inflation very high. If you valued inflation more than you would say, you know what, I want to be more aggressively to unwind my balance sheet and I want to be more aggressive in hiking rates. Um, even though that will hurt unemployment, that tackles inflation more. So you, this is ultimately a hard question. It depends on your values as a, as a, as a committee. And so, that will be in part shaped by who becomes an ex chair of, of the Fed. So that's something to think about as well. Okay, so uh, then let's move on to the next question, which is, what do you think about the coins? Do they have the chance to replace the paper money? Yeah, you know, I, I think though that there is an effort in the in there is an effort to replace paper money with a CBDC. But it's but it's by a group of people and that's not necessarily in dominant power yet. So I would think, for example, if you listen to, let's say, Governor Quarles talk about CBDCs a while back, he's not really sure what role they play, that whether we really need them. But if you talk about, if you look at speeches by Brennan, for example, she'll think CBDCs are a great thing. So I think this is a political problem that will be resolved, basically, depending on who comes to power. For myself, um, I, I think that uh, cash is a great thing to have because one, anonymity, and of course, you're not dependent upon any digital in infrastructure. So um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that I think uh, we should have if only as a protection from government. So who knows, one day, uh, you know, maybe the government doesn't like you and you just cancel all your money in your bank account, but at least you have some cash. All right. And uh, the, the same person asked this, he asked a second question, which is, how is USA going to decrease inflation? Um, what kind of instruments uh, will they use? And I think on the fiscal side, on the monetary side, and on the supply side. So I guess you have to think about what's driving inflation, right? Um, I think of what's driving inflation as just tremendous fiscal stimulus. Now, if you look at what the United States has done, the amount of fiscal stimulus is amazing. It's 25% of GDP. Now, if you compare that with other advanced economies, the, the average there is like, you know, 11, 12% of GDP. So obviously the US government spent a lot of money, gave a lot of people free money. And so that's creating demand and that's, uh, that's basically pushing up inflation. Now, if that's the case, then what you want to do is you want to tamp and down on demand. Um, you could do that by, let's say, raising taxes, but that's very difficult to do, and it takes time. Um, the easiest thing to do would be just to raise rates by a lot, and that would work. But you know, there are side effects to that as well. Um, if you raise rates a lot, you will crash the financial markets 100%. And usually, that makes people unhappy. Mm -hmm. And what do you think China's real estate market problems, including Evergrande, can spill over to the broader global markets? And how would that threat impact Fed's tapering plans, this person asks? So I don't worry about China at all. And uh, the reason being is that China is a very different country from, from, from the West. <clears throat> In China, the, the, uh, the party, the government controls everything. So it's very difficult to have any sort of crash. Um, let's say you're a company and you're, you're, you're having problems. Well, the, the government is interested in stability and employment. So they're just going to lend you money. They're forced the banks to lend you money. Um, I'll roll over bad loans forever. There, there's so many more policy levers there that they can do in China uh, that, that basically make any type of, any type of crash disorder basically impossible. The government controls everything. They they have the will 
and the tools to make sure that there's nothing disorderly that happens. Um, yeah, it's, I, that's, I, I don't worry about it. All right. And uh, the Anatolian asks, how can emerging market economies best guard against the economic fallout of a USD shortage if it should occur again? Decouple, hold treasury bonds or something else? Hmm. So, so traditionally what happens um, in, in historically in the past is that let's say a lot of EMs, they would issue dollar denominated debt. And so when there are dollar squeezes, then, you know, then they have come into trouble because they don't have enough dollars to repay their loans. I think, as I understand, that's been improved a lot. Sovereigns don't really issue. Um, so well, bigger picture, if you're worried about impacts of US dollars, then just don't issue as much US dollar debt, right? Just don't be reliant as much as possible. So the EM sovereigns, as I understand, don't really do that as much anymore. But some of the EM corporations continue to. So if you're worried about dollar squeezes, then I think the easiest way is to just reduce your dollar debt so that in case that there is a squeeze for dollars, you you won't be impacted by it that much. Um, but I understand that's a very difficult thing to do because the world runs on dollars. The good news is, though, there's really no dollar shortage. If you can see, look at the reverse repo facility, right? $1.5 trillion. Look at the amount of fiscal spending that the U.S. is doing. There, it's... I don't see a dollar shortage anywhere. And if you look at, um, let's say, dollar deposit rates, even in China, they're like 0%. So um, the world seems to be awash in dollars and as it as it should be. Look at the fiscal spending, look at the Fed's, uh, look at where Fed sets interest rates. There's very easy um, dollar liquidity conditions worldwide. Look at the FX swap basis. It's very narrow as well. And now, actually, one of the macro prudential uh, measures taken by the Turkish government was that the government limited uh, the amount of USD borrowing in the sense that if a firm doesn't have any USD denominated revenues, then that firm uh, would not be able to borrow in US dollars. So this is a this is one of the measures that an emerging market economy can take, I believe. Um, That's very it's smart. Yeah, it's a natural hedge, right? So you all you can hedge your dollar liabilities with your dollar revenue so then there's less of a chance that you will be in a, uh, a liquidity panic and we're also seeing emerging market economies raising interest rates in order to uh, cushion against uh, a rising dollar they're, uh, they're rising interest rates in order to uh, alleviate any potential uh, pressure in their exchange rates so that could be also said so uh, the next question is what do you think about Brainard's conservatism principle? Yeah, I'm not familiar with that. What is her conservatism <clears throat> principle? I'm, apologies, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, uh, no worries. The next question. Uh, what is your opinion, uh, the Fed monetary policy in terms of latest developments, the possible effects on precious metal market? Mr. So, Kandili. <laughs> yeah, you know, precious metals is, is an interesting market because you don't, it's, it's not really clear what drives it. Um, so let's say I remember back post, uh, post Lehman, uh, the, the gold gold market just went to the moon because everyone was looking at quantitative easing, thinking that there'd be a lot of inflation, and then you know nothing happened, and so gold went back down. And if you think there was a point in time where people were looking at gold and thinking that it was driven by real interest rates, right? Low or negative real interest rates makes gold go higher. We've had that for the past year, and you know nothing seems to happen. Um, so. I, to me, it's hard to know what drives gold. And another way you can think about this is that maybe the people who are interested in gold now are interested in <laughs> cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin. So maybe that is cannibalizing uh, what people who would usually invest in gold as well. But overall, and I say this, I, I own gold. Um, I think that if you think of gold as kind of twofold things, one is... Uh, as a hedge against government, you know, it's if you have gold, there's a 
it's it's there's no it's uh it's an asset it's not anyone else's liability so it's a sort of value that's outside of the banking system in case anything goes wrong and you know if you believe that there is going to be higher inflation and real rates just stay very negative as i do then i think eventually real assets will appreciate including gold mm -hmm. so um i think of the policy if you assume that the fed will continue to be accommodative that it will err between choosing its mandates towards more emphasis on lowering unemployment than inflation, then you know you have to assume that real rates will stay negative. Then I think that helps all real assets, including gold. Uh, okay, and uh, the next question is: How would the upcoming Fed actions by the end of 2022 impact the energy markets of any sort? So. When I look at the past few hist the past few years, you know, energy is a it's a financial asset, right? So, when there are financial crashes, energy crashes, and there are, and you know, uh, part of it is because it's a lot of energy trading is done by leveraged investors, and so when part of their positions crash, they have to sell their energy positions to make others. So everything is connected through through the investor base. Um, so, in to the extent that you have so. To the extent that you have, let's say, Fed tightening that could impact risk assets negatively, it seems like that would hurt energy. But from what I understand, and I'm not an energy expert on energy, from what I understand, though, is that there's significant underinvestment in fossil fuels, and yet the world is still very much dependent upon fossil fuels. And so that mismatch um, is kind of a tailwind in energy markets, and you can kind of see that um, throughout the energy markets. I mean right now people are right now oil is high but if you look at coal if you look at net gas basically all the fossil fuels are very high right now so that's just my understanding of reading it um i would uh defer to someone who follows energy markets more closely i think part of the reason why key industrial metals and energy prices have risen considerably and they, why uh the supply has not been able to meet excess demand is um is due to underinvestment because with COVID, producers weren't able to forecast aggregate demand. So as they weren't able to forecast aggregate demand uh, to, a, to a precise extent, uh, uh, they weren't able to respond to this excess demand as, that, as much as they would have otherwise been able to uh, had they made uh, investments in the production of these uh, key energy units or key industrial metals. No, and no, I, that's my understanding as well. Meaning, commodity cycles tend to be boom and bust. When prices are high, people invest a lot. New supply comes online. All the commodity prices crash. <laughs> then no one does any more investments, and then prices go higher, and then people start doing investments again. And now prices seem to be climbing higher. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the same person asks. Is silver still a monetary metal or is it behaving like an industrial metal only? As such, does it perform better during stagflation or economic booms? By the way, I'm just speeding up a little bit because we just have a few minutes. Yeah, so, okay, I understand. So silver is really interesting to me, right? So if you look at all the in the metals, industrial or precious like gold, everything has gone up a lot, but silver, it doesn't really do anything, right? Uh, silver still hasn't, I think it, the high back a few years ago was like 50, we're like, you know, 25 or 50% below that. And even gold has made you highs and copper, steel, they're all, they're uh, aluminum are all, you know, towards the high end, but silver just sits there. So I'm not really sure what's happening there. It, it seems like, it seems like it should be, if you were wanted to trade it as a precious metal, it seems like it should follow gold higher, but gold's making, gold has already made new highs recently. Silver is like 50%. Uh, below its uh, highs. If you want to think of it as a base metal, it's a copper, aluminum, steel, iron ore, all had their time in the sand, in the sun, but silver doesn't do anything. So I, I'm not sure what's happening there. It, it seems strange to me. All right. And I'm going to be asking you the last question okay. of the day from Mr. Ur Akhtan. Uh, he asks, do you think the Federal Reserve is too late to intervene in the inflation situation? And uh, I would also like to ask you a question in this regard. Do you think the developed economy central banks 
uh, might be a bit late in terms of intervening uh, in this particular situation. So um, obviously they're too late, right? Inflation is far above their targets. Uh, but here's the thing though, central banks are political institutions and you have duly elected uh, you know, democratic officials wanting to boost inflation, engaging in basically uh, very inflationary policy. So that's, that's their mandate. Um, it's very, it would be very troublesome for the, for a central bank to kind of intervene in these elected uh, representatives and what they're doing, right? So, um, so it's a, it's in a tough place that central banks have a bunch of people are elected to, let's say, give away free money, lower employment and so forth. Byproduct of that is inflation. I think it's very difficult for a central bank to step in and just kind of push against that. Um, so in a sense, you can think about it as maybe less monetary policy independence, but that's, but the truth is that, you know, central banks operate as part of the government. It's a political reality. The, uh, the realm of central banking is really interesting. Uh, there are so many aspects to it, so many things to analyze and, um, it's, it's a journey that never uh, ends. There is a continuous process of learning when analyzing monetary policy, financial plumbing. So uh, we've taken the last question. Thanks everyone. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Uh, I, if you are interested in financial plumbing and central banking monetary policy, Mr. Wang has written an excellent book in the name of Central Banking 101. So do make sure to check his book out. It's an amazing read uh, to better. You will be you will have a better understanding of financial plumbing. So uh, it's been an honor and a privilege to host Mr. Joseph Wang today. We have discussed financial plumbing and monetary policy and uh, see you guys later. Bye. Thanks for thanks for tuning in. Bye. <laughs> Bye.